I built a round test rig, if you will, for the motor because the other one had been straight. And the idea with that one was that I would only go through a narrow range of angles just up and down to test different different loads on it, and particularly the stall torque. But I realized I was getting way ahead of myself and that it would be much easier to have a round one where you could simply put more or less weight on it and then you'd have several revolutions worth that you could accelerate and decelerate, which is probably a more accurate test of the loads that I'm going to have. I also spent some time thinking again if I wanted to stay committed to the stepper motors versus regular motors strategy. And I'm going to stick with steppers right now because I do have that torque and the power control like you saw right there. I can stop this thing on a dime that I feel is going to be useful. The ability to freewheel because a regular motor has to be geared down quite a bit. So the ability to make it just freewheel, it's going to spin a lot faster and I feel like that could cause problems. So for the time being... Sticking with stepper motors, although down the road, I would certainly reconsider if it makes sense. I did want to test the current generated by the stepper motor when freewheeling, so I spun it by hand, and you can see here on the driver that some of the lights light up, but it doesn't appear to be anything too serious, and I'll measure this later. I was just concerned that if it was going to be a lot of current, then I may need to shunt it to the side and dump it into a light bulb or a resistor or something, but for the moment, I'm going to leave it alone. Controlling the motor turned out to be much more difficult than I expected. Not because it's complicated, but just in the pulling it off part of it. So this stepper motor requires a pulse for every step. And the issue with that is that the Arduino natively outputs PWM, or I should say it has a built-in function to output PWM. And that's what the signal is that you see here. It's pulse width modulated. So if we divide it into even divisions, you can see that the pulse goes high at the same point each time, and then it's simply the width within that fixed distance that varies. This isn't going to work for the stepper motor, though, because the stepper motor takes one step when that pulse goes high, and since this is the same place, it's going to go at the same speed. So I need to modulate not the width, but the frequency, so pulse frequency modulation. The width, or the duty cycle of the PFM signal, which is the percentage that's down low there, it doesn't matter as much as long as it spends a certain amount of time high, enough to trigger the stepper motor, which in this case was about 10 microseconds. But I go with 50% just because it's a solid number and it's, it's sure to trigger in that case. It gives you a little leeway. The problem with PFM is in generating the signal. Arduino has a built-in functions that help you generate PWM signals, but for PFM, there are a few different options on how you can generate that. All you need to do is write a signal high and write a signal low. So it seems pretty simple, but you need to be able to have that frequency, that time between them, very consistent, and that's what makes it tricky. The problem with writing pulses directly high and low with the program, just saying digital write high, digital write low, is that sometimes your loop takes a different amount of time to run, and that'll screw it up. It'll make the frequency higher or lower, and the stepper motor will run too slow. The corresponding problem is if you do successfully take care of that issue, you're still going to be running your control loop and your PID controller or whatever you're using at a different frequency. So the sample rate is going to change depending on how fast the motor is going, and that'll really screw things up. What I need is to be able to run my control loop at a fixed time interval and then update the rate that the motor is driving at. And I thought about a couple different ways to do that. I thought, what if I used a DAC? What if I was able to send out a digital signal and convert it to an analog pulse or a frequency? But the problem with the DAC is that you have to act, or my understanding at least, is you have to actively output what you want that analog pulse to be. I can't hand it off. I thought about using other microprocessors to sit there and just write it high and low. But the problem with that is you have to be able to get the signal into them without goofing it up. That also requires another processor, more programming. You have to talk to it digitally. It seemed like a lot of hassle. It didn't feel like the right solution. You can also, I thought about doing PWM through hardware to go to a voltage-controlled oscillator because my impression of a voltage-controlled oscillator, or initially from reading through it, was that you vary the voltage and it would vary the oscillations. But this doesn't appear to be the case. Even the programmable ones seem like they're a fixed oscillation. So I'm not really clear on what the value is there. It seemed like a lot of them had to be set at the factory. It didn't seem like the term voltage-controlled oscillation was very accurate. I also thought about trying to make some sort of RC timer. So I ran through a lot of different options, but what I eventually settled on was using interrupts, and this was after digging around through 
different things. I realized that I did not have a good understanding of how interrupts worked. I realized this at night and I actually put it on my calendar, as you can see right here. So I decided to go with timer interrupts with direct port manipulation. I haven't done the direct port manipulation, and it looks like I need another parenthesis on there. But I haven't done the port manipulation yet, but I'm going to because apparently digital writing high and low on the Arduino takes something like 160 or over 100. It was a lot of clock cycles to pull that off because it's doing error correction or detection and some other things. And that you can reduce the clock cycles by a factor of 60 was one number that I saw on that. So that would definitely help speed things up. Not that it's going particularly slow with the digital write, but I want to be able to maintain that you know, PFM as crisply as possible. It probably seems like I went off on a bit of a wild goose chase trying to figure out how to generate these signals. But this strategy has served me pretty well in the past, which is that you, you say, what am I really looking for? Instead of looking for a pre-built PFM generator or something, you look, what is something that generates variable frequencies based on an input? What, out, what outputs do I have available? How could I transform them into what I need? It served me well before. And uh, the one that I didn't mention also is that the Arduino does generate tones directly as a tone function. But the problem with the tone function is you can only generate one tone at a time. And even just in this very basic prototype, I have two motors. And later, I would probably have four at least that I can think of, potentially more. So one tone at a time, not going to cut it. The way that I'm generating these signals with the timer interrupts is not through entirely my own thing. I'm using the Timer1 library, which I found very helpful. So thank you to Jesse Tain and Lex Talionis. I'll put a link down in the info because this fixed it. It was exactly what I needed. <laughs> it's great when you find something like that. I actually put it under the bookmark goldmine exclamation point when I first came across it. Now that I had a good way of generating the pulse frequency signals that I needed, it was time to start playing with the motor and seeing how smooth I could get it to go, working on accelerating and decelerating. You can see that it'll freeze occasionally when you try to ramp really quickly on the speed, and that's because it just it starts missing steps and then there's too much inertia. It can't be overcome by those very short pulses. In that previous video, I was ramping the I was changing the frequency manually, but here it's just cycling through it and you can see that it increases slowly. And then it goes straight from 185 kilohertz to a megahertz, which is the fastest that it's going to go. And the problem, the reason why that it's it's doing this, it's it's not ramping linearly. What it's doing is changing the frequency linearly. And so the problem with that is that when you have, for example, a hundred microsecond period, a hundred microsecond time between increases in pulse, if you decrease by 10 at the beginning, you take it from 100 down to 90. It's a 10% difference. But then you get down to the bottom when you go from 20 to 10, you just it's a 50% increase. So you get a huge spike in the rate of the motor when you come down to the lower end if you don't account for this. The same thing is on display here, but the pulses are extremely short because I was trying to find the minimum necessary to trigger the stepper driver. And I had read somewhere early on that it required a millisecond pulse which I didn't think much about at the beginning. And then I realized later that a millisecond is a really long time and that that was really going to interfere with my ability to do anything. It didn't seem that that could be correct. So I started dialing it down and I got down to 10 microseconds. It would trigger pretty well, a little bit lower than that, but 10 was pretty reliable every time. And that's 10 microseconds stated in the Arduino code, which does not necessarily correlate directly to precisely 10 microseconds uh, actual pulse that comes out when you get down at those very low or high frequencies. When you do account for this inverse relationship, you can see here that it scales much more smoothly on the speed. It seemed to be accelerating and decelerating pretty smoothly, but I wanted to do a, a physical check to see if it was missing any steps. So what I did was I set it up where the starting point, the screw that's coming out, is lined up with the wire box that's on there. And then I eyeballed down it after it had accelerated and decelerated in one direction and then went back in the other. And it came out right on, so things are looking good. Now that I have decent control over the motor, 
as far as making it simply go and accelerate, it's time to start putting some real numbers to it. I did a test and it seems like 500 full steps per second, which is two and a half RPM or two and a half RPS is about the fastest that I could foresee myself needing on this project. So 500 full steps per second, maximum. 16 micro steps seemed like the best one as far as being quiet and smooth. So that's 8,000 pulses per second maximum needed. So my PFM signal needs to go from zero to eight kilohertz. If we invert those values, the frequency range for that eight kilohertz means that my minimum period is 125 microseconds. That's millionths of a second. For no motor speed, you need to disable the motor. So that's effectively an infinite uh, period. But for the slowest operating speed of the motor, we're going to use one pulse per second, which is one million microseconds. For the time being and for simplicity, I've decided to vary my motor, my throttle number between zero and 100. Zero is no motion, one begins the motion, 100 is top speed. So there's actually 101 values. The, so when you work it out, that's 80 hertz increase per, per unit of throttle. So when we work it out, a throttle of a value of one for one second produces 0 0.025 revolutions. So the unit that I'm gonna be able to use here to figure out how far I've gone from my control system is 0 0.025 revolutions per throttle second. We can see that inverse relationship in this graph again. It's pretty obvious there. And when you look at the numbers too, you can see that when you go from a throttle unit of one to two, there's a difference of over 6,000 microseconds. But when we come down into the high 90s, going from say 98 to 99 on the throttle, we're down into the single digit microseconds difference. This is the part of the week where the project hit a snag. I'd really been hammering on this project, making a lot of progress, just feeling good about it. You run into an issue, you, you work on it, and you're able to solve it, move on to the next one. And I was really hoping that I could get this thing hooked up this week and drive the arm. I wanted it to happen so badly, but it, it couldn't happen because I started to have an error. I had begun noticing some odd things with the counter chip a little bit earlier, but I had ignored it for the time being. And it was finally time to go back and look into it. So the problem was that no matter how many times you reset the chip and whether you did it manually or did it automatically, and I went through a lot of other options too, it was stuck at 514, which is kind of an odd number because it doesn't correspond to anything. It's not a direct power of two. I couldn't figure out quite where it was coming from. And I, mean, I tried some other things, you know, I turned it into a float and the arrow was 514.00. So <laughs> that wasn't very helpful. But what I eventually narrowed it down to was that if you convert 514 into binary, because I'm reading this out of the chip eight bits at a time, so we convert into binary and then we divide it in two here, you can see that the, with the first eight bits and with the second eight bits, the second one is one. That gives you 514. So what I realized was that that second bit was stuck high and it would never reset. Now this chip actually puts out 32 bits, but I'm only using eight because I'm not doing enough revolutions to need the other ones. So in any case, so if I was reading all four, it would be an even larger error number. And what I realized is that it's winter here. And you can see here, this is in the garage, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, 16% humidity. I mean, that's cold and it's still at 16%. So in the warm areas, it's even drier. And I wear socks inside, walk around on the carpet, things like that. Um, it generates static electricity. And these components are sensitive to static as they remind you very prominently on all the packages. ESD protection was something that I've seen, of course, other places. I just hadn't got around to it. It's one of those things that hasn't been an issue yet. So, uh, you know, it's just on the list. Well, now it's at the top of the list because it's not really about the $11 that the chip cost. It's more about the time that was spent and the frustration factor. It's just not a worthwhile way to spend your life going through uh, silly mistakes. So... I bought an ESD mat and put that down and I will be using it religiously from now on. I had ordered more parts, but they didn't come until Friday. So I wasn't able to really use them this week, but I have collected, gotten a new collection of switches here because one of the things that I need to be able to do with this project is switch between modes. You're gonna have your sort of neutral mode where nothing happens. You're gonna have your record mode where we need to turn off power to the stepper driver and simply record from the encoders. 
And then we need to have a drive mode where everything's energized and it's, it's driving all of them. So I have a couple different switches here, which we're gonna to use to switch between those. And this of course brought me into the topic of debouncing switches. I didn't spot any actual bouncing on the tactile push switches that I had, but I know the flip ones can be can be worse on that. But even looking at this, this push one here, you can see that while it does go cleanly from one state to the other, it ramps up over time. And Jack Gansel, I think I'm saying his name right, has a paper on this about debouncing switches. And he talks about how even that intermediate level, because when you're using digital logic, that intermediate zone can be identified as anything. There, there's a range at the bottom, which is zero. There's a range at the top, which is one. And that intermediate value can get detected either way. So while I haven't had a problem yet with bouncing on the, on the input signal, I'm going to keep an eye out for this and definitely try to take care of it because that's just another one of those issues that I don't want to fight with. I also got tired of using screw terminals for things that are frequently connected and disconnected, like these motor connections. And these ones are have an additional layer of uh, complexity because you have to make sure they're in the right order. It's not that difficult, but when you have to do it several times, why bother? So I soldered them to these servo type pins, or at least that's what I've used them before for. And that didn't work too well. They ended up going in all directions because it melted the plastic. So I'll definitely have to opt for the crimp pins in the future. I also thought about using a commercially available connector like this USB 3 one here. I chose three because it has nine pins or eight pins and then the outer part. So the problem with that is that there's a ton of shielding inside of a USB 3 wire. I mean, everything is shielded and separated out and then twisted pairs and the wires ended up being very small. So that didn't really work out, but it was kind of fun to tear it apart and see how everything works. That's it for this week. I think that a lot of these baseline things are out of the way now and working pretty well. So as long as I don't zap any of the stuff again with my with my socks, we should be good to go and start making it more visually appealing, having the arm move. And I'm pretty excited also to start pulling in that encoder data and making little graphs, you know, that are representing what's going to happen. So definitely looking forward to that and see you next week. Thank you.